but he also had a job and a family. He has an HGV license, a heavy goods vehicle driving license, and he was a long distance lawyer. He had two sons. The nature of his offence, he was in a sex offenders prison, means that uh, he doesn't have contact with his family anymore. He doesn't have contact with his kids. And over the years, I've seen a man there who might fit the description. There, but for the grace of God, <coughs> Andy likes to be active. He plays football. He works as a trusted employee in the office's mess in the kitchens. He acknowledges that he's made mistakes, but he's accepted his punishment and he's ready to move on. But he knows that life post release will be tough. We talk about his hopes and his fears where he might live, how he can find a job. Will he be able to play football after prison? How he will make friends. Prison staff and probation officers, they'll discuss these things with Andy. But perhaps what a befriender brings, what I bring, is an opportunity to give a, an outsider's perspective, based on nothing more than common sense and that willingness to listen. And for somebody who has nobody else to turn to, that might be valuable. So the essence of our work as we reach as volunteers is to provide that connection between prison and the world outside. We do this by writing letters and visiting prisons. Many of the men, it's mostly men that we support, are serving long sentences, and sadly, Andy will not be the only one who has no contact with family. Letter writing covers a great panorama of experiences for us all, whether as volunteers or prisoners. We get long, articulate pistols to very short letters. They're all value. One of the volunteers in our group, and we, we meet monthly as groups to provide mutual support, and one of the, the volunteers, Bridget, had a new chap that she was supporting, and she came to our group meeting, she said, I cannot decipher, I cannot make head or tail of these letters. And collectively, we'd all pour over them. The letter would be on the table and we'd try and pick out words that we could identify and try and decipher what the letter was all about. So then last October, Bridget came in and she was smiling. She said, Wow, I got a letter from David. And I could understand. In fact, it was a, a Christmas card. She said, Christmas cards were early in October. And I could understand every word, she said. Wow, we were surprised. And there were three words on the uh, Christmas card. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> At the other extreme, we had a volunteer who had a chess game with a person in prison. Quite slow as the letters went backwards and forwards. Plenty of time to think of the next move. So the letters, wherever they're formed, they're all valued and they're welcomed. They're the framework on which the relationships are built between the man in prison and the volunteer. They're a common thread, they're a tangible sign of support and commitment. And those letters are complemented by visits to men in prison. Last year our volunteers travelled 120,000 miles. <laughs> it's sadistic. But what is important here is our approach tries to maintain contact with the person in prison. So in our society, in our community, in the criminal justice system, people get moved from one prison to the next. It happens for various reasons. Newbridge commits to stay with the prisoner. So as people get moved, our volunteer will make the longer journey, or sometimes a shorter journey, depending on where the move goes. It's invaluable for many people in prison, find it difficult when they move. They have to form new relationships, they have to learn new systems. They're quite often understandably concerned and anxious. And having a common thread of a Newbridge volunteer who will stay with them can be extremely valuable. And some of our volunteers continue to work with people after they leave prison. We call this through the gate work. And that goes on. Not so much, but we used to be funded for it and no longer funded. It's a different form of commitment and it requires additional training usually uh, for the volunteer. So maybe my own experience here is a good example. I have a relationship with Jim. I first met Jim in Brixton Prison in December 2009. So we're nearly 10 years into our relationship. 
Our journey together has had its ups and downs. We found houses and places to live more than once. We found jobs and work to do, but not usually for very long. And I've travelled around the country as Jim sadly found himself back in prison. But we stay with us. We stay with him. And my most recent experience, he was released in December, the end of December. My most recent experience is understanding universal credit. And we made our application on December 28th, and he received his first payment on the 1st of May. So like most voluntary organizations, Newbridge is challenged to demonstrate that it makes a difference. And we survey prisoners and we ask them what they think. And you won't be surprised. The statistics tell us 80% of prisoners say that Newbridge helped them to think about their futures in a more positive way. They value having a support network. They value being recognized as human beings. Not very surprising at all. And the statistics are complemented by the surveys and the quotes. Here's a typical comment from a prisoner. I feel a deep sense of shame in regard to my offences, and I often feel that I'm going to be ostracised by society on my release. No one would want to associate with someone who's done what I've done. But my Newbridge friend sees me as a person beyond my offences. She sees me as a person and not a criminal. And if she can see this, maybe other people will see this. Life on release may be not so bad after all. So now you know something of what we do, a little bit about whether it does any good. So the question most asked of the volunteers is, so why do you do it? So just as people in prison, so as people as volunteers, we're all unique. We all have our own motivations, aspirations. But perhaps a recurring theme is that of concern for our brothers and sisters in society, for our common humanity. And in the sense of this community of St. Vincent de Paul, a response clearly to the message of the Gospels. In particular, all is for me, Matthew 25, I was a prisoner visiting me. And Jesus went on to say, insofar as you did this to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. So I have a simple view of life. <coughs> as we journey along, we will all benefit from a helping hand from time to time. Sometimes an up and down journey and the helping hand will be welcome. Many of the people that we meet in prison have never known or experienced a genuine helping hand. As volunteers, we're in a very privileged position to be able to offer support. Why would we not want to do that? Managing chaplain at HMP YOI Hindley. So HMP is a Majesty's prison, the YOI bit is Young Offence Institution. So that then means that we take lads from age 18 and upwards. Um, so what's happening in prisons? The number of prisoners has risen um, to 80% over the past 30 years. Right. We are in a serious crisis. Right. We do not have the resources we do not have the spaces to house all the people that they are putting into custody. 
Um, 30% of the lads that come in, and I'm speaking lads, I'll, I'll keep saying lads because that's where I predominantly work amongst, amongst male offenders. Um, the, fi the, the, the figures are slightly different for in the female estate, the worst. 30% um, have learning disabilities, and this is the frightening one, which proves that actual locking people up, in, in essence, doesn't work, because 50% back inside within a year, and a figure that we haven't got up on there is nearly 80% are back inside within two years. All right, that's, so we as taxpayers are paying this money to, to look after these lads, um, and we're not actually getting a good return. Thank you. Um, so, Hindi Prison. Well, we're near Wigan, um, the pie eaters of the world. Um, you can tell I haven't got a, a Hindi accent because you wouldn't understand me whatsoever. I've been up there 12 years and still don't understand what they say. Um, so, we hold 545 male prisoners ranging from 18 to old, because we do on occasions get quite elderly prisoners. Um, we have up to 20, 235 18 to 25 year olds. They've recently moved the bar um, and now they consider um, the youngsters up to 25. Um, and we look at, it's about behaviour in that as well. Um, so approximately, we have average 15 lads a week get released back into the community. Um, and of these, at least one has no home to go to. Sometimes that is more. When we know home, that means absolutely nothing. That means sleeping straight onto the street. And yet, they've been in prison and we're pushing them out onto the street. Out of the, the 14 that have a home, doesn't mean that they've actually got a home. That could mean that they are sofa surfing. So they're sleeping on different sofas every night for, for donkeys. And we wonder why they commit an offence and come back into prison. Okay, so come up to release. A lad is released. The government are really kind. We give them forty-three pounds. Can we expect that to to feed them, clothe them, look after them until they can get their benefits? We will be able to comment on how long it's taken for benefits to come through. Um, this is a, a a frightening one, and for us within the prison system, it's not something that we really clicked onto until quite recently. We've, we've Talked about it more in the. Um, if you're arrested in the summer, the clothes that you were arrested in, quite often the clothes that you get released, especially if it's like a short term. So if I got arrested in this summer and then I'm, I'm due out in December, I'm going out in those same clothes. So I broke down in oh, t shirt and shorts. So that's what I'm going out in in the height of December. Isn't it wrong? Isn't it wrong that we're throwing these lads out, back out into the community, dressed incorrectly? So we can come up with some ideas of, of tackling that. Um, <clears throat> they're told to go to the probation office. Quite often it will be a different probation office to the area that they know. So they don't even know where it is. And some probation offices are in areas that they're best off not going to if they've got some addiction or problems. They're best off not going there anyway, so we're not even going to go there. Um, the world moves on. We were driving down today, Marcus, weren't we? Um, today, even just cars. Even in a couple of years, cars are different. You know? It's amazing how many things in society move on when you're not actually part of it. Okay, this is, this is brilliant. Um, this is Ian put this together. Um, this is good, but it still looks bad. So, this is Lee, up in the, uh, the top right. Release from prison about half past nine in the morning. They have to be at probation for half past ten, so 16 miles away. There's no direct bus route from Hindley Prison to St Helens. And I don't know if anybody's been to St Helens. It's, it's an offshoot of Liverpool. Um, very, I mean, the gentleman was speaking earlier on, massive poverty area. Um, so it goes to probation. Then they have to be at the hostel right in the heart of Liverpool at half past three. Don't always get there. Don't know where they're going. Some of these lads have mental health issues and haven't got a clue how to get on a bus, how to get a train, how to get a taxi. Bear in mind, they've only got 43 quid. We will give them a, rank, a rail warrant, but that, they still don't get them there. So here's little Hindley. 
That is the gate and our front door. So behind those walls lives 545 lads with different issues. Right. That there is what you'll get used to inside the prison, the fence. What that picture doesn't show, and that's an older picture now, in front of you is the, that's the edu one of the education blocks. And on that grass patch in between us and the path is, is our department, actually. The chaplaincy building has been put in there. Um, so that's our little oasis. So what are the issues? As I've said, many have mental health issues. Many have poor education. Our wonderful government, um, whatever parties they are, keep going on about the lads need to learn to read and write. I get it, I understand it. But if you've got a lad that hasn't been to school, didn't learn to read and write at the age of 13, 14, 15, 16, how do we expect them to sit in a classroom <coughs> at the age of 50, learning to read and write, using the same techniques that they tried to use with them at a young age? And we wonder why they kick off and create and don't want to be in there. Instead, we should be looking at teaching them how to read and write and embed it in different ways. Prime example, what we're trying to do at our place um, is in, in, in the woodwork shop. So they're learning to read, they've got to read the instructions. They're learning to write, because they've got to write how they're going to do it. And they're learning some maths, because they're measuring and they're taking things away. And that's the way to get it. And the next minute, you say to them, yep, you're doing it. They don't realise. Um, very much within the Catholic world, um, we know there's lots of travellers. Um, prisons is no different, we do get lots. Can't read and write. I tell you what, the maths in their heads, unbelievable. <laughs> only, only they put that to some use instead of coming into the prisons. Amazing, I don't know how to do it. You know, the computer, their brains are far better than these computers for retaining that information. Um, We've got yeah, some traumas such as being abused. Yes, many have. Um, a, new, a new phrase that's out at the moment is ACEs, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences. There's some fantastic stuff on the, on, on the internet. Um, Blackbird and Darwin have been superb. They've produced some stuff around that. Um, it's, it's talking about if a young person has at least two of these ACEs, major traumatic things in their life, it could be living with a parent with mental health, it could be a family breakup. Um, it could be complete poverty. Um, it, it, it does have uh, that traumatic experience on it. So, over 30% of hidden prisoners are classed as having care experience. That's an area that I look after within the prison, and it's quite alarming. Um, and some lads don't even know that they've had care experience, and yet they have in their lives. Um, things are getting worse. I can't, I can't stand here and paint a, a great picture. There are cutbacks in prisons and support services outside because of the austerity. Um, and if we can't feed their families in the community, if we can't fix their people in their hospitals, then why should we spend it on prisoners? Um, let's be honest, SVP shouldn't be in existence. Shouldn't have to have it. We shouldn't have to have RBL, British, Royal British League. We shouldn't have to have charities. They shouldn't have to exist because we, as a modern world country, should be able to care for our own without having to have charitable status to, to look after them. Um, so we, but we need it. We need it in prison. So how did the SCP become involved in Hindley? Um, Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie is, um, is my Roman Catholic chaplain. Um, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, she wanted to start a faith inside training course for about 10 lads. Um, I hold the budget for my chapter CT and I ain't got no money. I've got nothing in this squad. So I can't just buy these books. Um, but we got it. We got it thanks to SVP. I funded the books. Um, and, it's, and that's going on. That course um, is delivered on Friday morning. Uh, but the SVP District Council gave us some money for 48, 48 hours of hearing the problem. That is quick. Anybody that works within any bureaucratic organisations like prison service and stuff like that, it can take ages to get money. But we got money straight away. So instead of talking about it, it happened and it was quick. 
Um, Southwest Lakes uh, met the chaplains um, and were shocked to see that we could easily make a significant difference to some prisoners' lives. Oh yeah, you do. So what's it like in jail? Um, can be locked up for 23 hours. Sometimes you have no TV or just a few channels you can read or can't read because not got glasses. Um, it's a wonder that they have depressive thoughts to self harm or become aggressive. Um, we were immediately helped, made able to help by giving two hundred pounds to the chaplains. Now, this is this is one thing that I really wanted to take away um, to buy puzzles, words, searching, colouring books. Um, anybody do colouring or, or crosswords and things like that? Right. You do it because you enjoy doing it, and it gives you something to do. A prisoner sometimes in prison does these things, and it saves their lives. It's as simple as that. It's, it's one message that I really want you to, to walk away from. A simple one pound book can stop a lad from hanging himself, or from cutting himself. And that's as simple as it is, and that's the message that I really want to get out. Small things, quickly made a big difference. The glasses, the glasses was a big one, wasn't it? With reading glasses. You have to wait to see the optician. Right? And, and a lot of the lads, it is simply those little glasses that you can buy for a couple of quid, and they can suddenly see the words. So what does SVP do? They go out and buy a load, they give them to the education department, and now when the lads go, oh, I can't quite see that, they get a pair of glasses. I've got no funds for that, the prison system's got no funds for that, and they've even thought of funds for that. But SVP made a very big difference. Okay, this is about the first visit. So there is some safeguarding issues that we need to look at. Um, National insurance, passport, no money, uh, keys, mobile phone, definitely no mobile phones. Um, and could it be frisked? Yeah, could be searched. Um, and escorted through several gates in high fences. Actual fact, there was the there was the write up about it, wasn't there? And that's something that she commented on. Um, it can feel quite quite enclosed at times, can't it? You know, barbed wire, razor wire on on, on the top. And um, we got one stretch when you come in to our visit centre. I describe it as as a, as a German concentration camp, but that's what it looks like you know, as you're walking up this path. And that, the little kids are looking up there. That's not good. This is where it really suddenly kicks off. Every year we have a carol service, um, and we had 60 chairs laid out, 30 people were there, some prison officers, sector governor, priest, um, and myself. Um, 30 prisoners had earned sufficient privileges to attend. We sang carols, well, we tried to sing carols, <laughs> um, together and prayed. Afterwards, the lads served us tea and biscuits. Um, what was interesting, and, and I, I forget this, uh, I really do forget it because I've been in there 24 years now, so I, I take it for granted. But people coming in from outside can feel a little bit scared and worried. What? Society paints prisoners as these horrible, evil, twisted, nasty people. I'm not going to lie to you, some are. Some people are really evil. And that's all you hear about on the news, because you hear of the most horrendous crimes. But actual fact, 95% are people that just need a little bit of love, a little bit of support. They wanted to talk. They love talking. I have to listen to them all day long, and it's great. But they love talking, because nobody listens. They could not believe that we would give up our time to listen to people who regarded themselves as nobodies. The self-esteem has gone. Okay, they were crafty, they got this picture done when I was on the, on the lead. So there's Anne Marie on the far right, and these are her boys, right? she does consider them her boys. So we've got some FDP members, um, and we've got Marcus Aaron, his green t-shirt, um, Ian, and a few of the travellers in the middle, and then yeah, we've got me on the end, George, Greg, Steve, and Ian, and Anne Marie, Tony, Izzy, and I'm not doing that. John, such a casual person. Oh, right. Okay. Just so he is a prisoner, he was released. Yeah. It, it's, um, 
It's important that because Tony, Tony Blackburn, not the not the DJ, Tony Blackburn, um, he's he's a treasurer for our own branch of SDP. Um, so he, he, he does all the buyings. What am I like for time? Speed up. Uh, speed up a bit. Speed up a bit. Okay. Yeah. Right, okay, get on. Cut all these through. Um, yeah, just do that bit. I want to get to um, get to Marcus really. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it's a quick one on this one. Um, there are lots of organisations that come in, but um, where I am extremely grateful for SVP is there is no red tape. Right. And the bottom line. Um, Ian put this on. It's, it's something that I strongly believe in. Um, I'm not Catholic, um, but I'm a member of the SVP now, so that we can that we can run this. But I consider that money, those funds, are sacred. They are from people that have kindly donated their money, whether it's through legacies, to to the benefit of other people. So we are strict. We do make a massive difference, but we won't fritter it away. Lots of small little things. Um, yeah. Okay. Get through this one without shedding a tear. Go on, you can. Okay, so Craig. Craig was a chap who extremely vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. Um, massive mental health issues. Would walk around with a radio um, to his ear playing white noise because it would block out the, the voices. Um, he was going to be released. Chaplaincy team and SVP worked extremely hard with their near Craig, um, and we got to really, got to really love him. Um, two chaplains drove in, actual fact, it was um, two volunteers. So one SVP volunteer, and one of my um, other chaplaincy volunteers, and a member of the, cha uh, a member of the prison service. Drove him not far from here to Nottingham. That's where he came from. Um, there was no accommodation. They ran round the whole of Nottingham trying to sort stuff out because you couldn't sort anything out till the end. And so it, it was rubbish. They were expecting them to sleep on the streets. And this was a real big test for SVP. We needed help. They knew we needed help. What could they do? Well, they paid up for three nights B and B. Um, that for us then meant that I could go home to my bed knowing where Craig was because we all absolutely fell in love with Craig. Um, yeah, cool. This is the bit that guts me. He survived one night, did our dear Craig. Um, no matter what we did and how we did support him, he took some drugs and he overdosed and he died. Um, it affected us big staff actually, um, really, everybody thinks people in Chaplaincy, in Chaplaincy world, you know, you deal with death all the time and that, but this was a lad that we, we loved the pieces and he did, it broke their hearts. Um, so, his mum was touched that he'd not been abandoned and left on the streets because SVP put him into a bed for the night. Someone who cared for her son. The collection that his funeral was given to SVP, because that's where she got the money to go. Um, and the SVP safeguarded Craig by giving him a roof over his head. They weren't going to allow him to sleep in the streets. Um, they used it to buy materials to the prisoners and built a big slave. Well, let's have, this, let's have a picture of their slave. Marcus doesn't like the slave because he, he used to have to take it and put it, take it apart and put it together again in his year. But there's, there's their slave that was used out of the money. And Father Christmas sits on there and he's actually a really gorgeous, hunky Father Christmas each year. Um, and guess who he is? Uh, he sits on there and gives out presents to the children, all right? And it's wonderful, yeah, absolutely. It's probably even giving presents to my own children is great, but this this beats it. It is it is superb to give these presents to the children. Um, what do you want me to do? Because we're running short. Sorry, we're short. Yeah. Okay. Right. Many many lads have um, had nothing. They have no families. Um, so we need to have basic clothing. We now have a wardrobe, second-hand wardrobe in our chaplaincy department, paid for by SVP, that is kitted out with second-hand clothes and some brand new clothes that we can give to lads that go out with nothing. 
We have suits and white shirts and black ties for the lads whose mum or dad has died and they can go to their funeral instead of going in a grey tracksuit and a grey top. They can actually look smart and, and, and attend the funeral, which is very important. Um, if we need to buy bus passes, furniture for flat, crockery, glass, bedding. Release on a Friday is always a nightmare because nothing's open the next day. <laughs> yeah, the world stops, but it doesn't for these, these lads' lives. Um, if there are any safeguarding issues, the chaplaincy will help with it. Because there may be some. You want me to talk about it? Cool, I'm going to talk about Marcus. Marcus is an alcoholic. Marcus, when he's drunk, can be violent. He's been in and out of custody all his life. He's now age 53. <laughs> But Marcus is sober. Marco, Marcus, unfortunately, he's not doing it anymore because he's good at it, was my chapel orderly. But most importantly, he was the listener in, in the establishment. He would listen to other prisoners that were threatening to self-harm. He's now released and comes back in to help other prisoners. So he comes in on a Wednesday, it's, it's increasing more and more um, that comes in. I have been 24 years in the prison service. I have never associated directly with an ex-prisoner out in the community. Yet today, picked you up from your home, um, drove down here, and I've got my granddaughter in the back, and then we introduced him to my mum, who's taken little and off around the grounds. Why? Because Marcus is a normal person. When Marcus is sober, Marcus is lovely. He just needs that support that he made. Yeah. But Marcus gives us support back. And I think that's what's important. So we used to have a chaplain and prisoner relationship. It ain't that anymore. It's a friend-friend relationship. And that's so important. I get so much from Marcus as Marcus gets from me. And that's how the relationship works. Um, Release has not been made easy now, it's been flipping hard. It's horrific. And please come grab us over the next two days and talk about what it's like after release. Because Marcus has had lots of help, yet it's still been an absolute flipping nightmare. So, in summing up, um, ladies are far more vulnerable with no self esteem and are traumatised by leaving young children behind. There's a report come out this uh, last week around females in, in prisons and they're trying to get rid of all these stupid short sentences that actually do nothing apart from destroy <coughs> family. Um, offer help to the chaplains. They will tell you what we need. Yes, we will tell you what we need. We need support. We need your love. We need to prayers. If you can't come in, that's fine. But you say your prayers. Pray for us. Pray for the lads that are in prison. Safeguarding. Um, because of the relationship built up in prison, as Anne Marie says, she feels safer in prison than outside. They look after each other. And bear in mind, she works with travellers, and they can be absolutely big pain. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, enough respect to Anne Marie. Um, prisoners have been told for years what they should do and what they should, when they should do it. Don't take this approach. Listen, offer advice only if they want it, and leave the decision to them. Marcus makes his decisions. Right, that's Marcus' his life. We're just there to support the unions. The life of prisoners can be improved a lot by simple acts of kindness. These do not cost much. As a fact, act of kindness costs absolutely diddly squat, doesn't it? Costs nothing. Costs nothing. So, as religious people, as Christians, um, if we focus on, if we focus on the life of our Saviour and what He taught, that's what we need to be doing. Don't have to be all these big, um, massive things that are going on. Little small acts of kindness. Cool. Small seedlings grow into mighty trees with the right nurture. So, Marcus, we're an oak now, mate, aren't we? Yeah. Feel like 200 year old at times, but yeah, we're an oak. So, that's important. That. So, here's, here's some emails. Um, if you want more advice, um, that is my email address. That's my Sunday name, Jason. Um, <laughs> Don't tell mother that because she, <laughs> she called me. Um, but yeah, 
email us if you want to know more. More than happy, more more than happy to share. Um, what we can do. We could speak for we could speak for hours, but we're, 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 we want the question and answers. That's the, that's the vision. Thanks, Jason. Cool. Thanks very much to Matt, for special coming. Can I say a few words, Matt? Sir? You want to say? Oh, all right. Thanks for the SVP. Because I got put into a, a approved premises for 12 weeks. Then once, once that was up, I was on the street. But uh, SVP comes along. It took them a few weeks to get me a flat. And they put me in bed for breakfast. And they looked after me. Normally when you're in prison and get released, you get all these promises from other people and strange charities that come in. And when, when you go through that gate, Nobody follows it up. This is the first time in you know, over 30 years that someone's ever helped me. And uh, I, I appreciate it. I'm not very good at talking. And I, I don't know how to say thank you very much. You'll never do it. <laughs> but that's, that's what I've got to say. Right. Thank you, Marcus. It's very special, Marcus, being with us today. Another very special person to be with us now. I'd like to introduce you, John Catefield, over here who is, um, he'll tell you about himself, uh, but basically he's doing quite a lot of work, actually helping us now uh, in the SDP, trying to do simple guides to try and find our way through this really complex prison system and post-prison. So John, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I was actually released from uh, Berlin prison in January of this year, and when I was released, I found that there wasn't a great deal of help there for anybody uh, that was released on the day of release. It, in fact, one, on the day that I was released, one of the guys who was released with me was just shown the door and given a rail warrant, and he didn't know he'd been in prison that long. He didn't know how to get to the train station. He didn't know how to then get to wherever he had to go that day. And it, it was down to me helping him, just putting him in a taxi with me, taking him to the station where I was going, and I put him on the train and tried to get him to Ellsbury Port, where he was had to be for his uh, approved accommodation. Prison's a strange place. It's not like anything that you can experience anywhere else. And you are living at close quarters with people that you don't know. There's always an atmosphere. There's people wanting to be top dog all the time. There's testosterone roaming, roaming around the place. And it's a minefield of emotion. And, and some people are living life on a knife edge because of the constant fear of the violence that can occur and it's not unreal, not unusual that you know it will occur for of the slightest thing that places in the dinner queue, you know, anything. Um, men need somebody to listen to them. Now there's a great deal of people in prison who want people to listen to them and they've got family and friends and they can talk to them and they can have visits. But there are a group of people that don't have anybody, they can have nobody who will listen to them, and they don't associate with anybody within the prison. Um, my first Padme, when I first went into Durham, um, was a middle-aged gay guy who had uh, woken up one morning to find his uh, partner dead in bed at the side of him. They'd both been drinking the night before, and obviously there'd been fists flying and what have you, but he was convinced in his own mind that he hadn't murdered this guy and that he just died of natural causes in the bed next to him. Now for two weeks while he was sharing with me, he went on and on at me. He wouldn't go out of the cell, he wouldn't talk to anybody else. Um, and it got a bit wary for me, to be fair, because I was only recently in prison. And I found, through the chaplaincy at Durham Prison, uh, a visitor to come in, uh, an SVP member as it was. Um, and they came in and they, spoke to him in an ordinary visit setting. So he'd go into the visit hall and he'd spend an hour with this visitor who'd come in once a fortnight and just talk. And he was able to just talk about whatever he wanted to. The visitor didn't do anything for him, wasn't giving him any advice, wasn't arranging to do things for him, it was just sitting there listening. And it was his contact with the outside world. His actual life changed by just getting that visitor to come in and talk to him. Uh, for one hour every fortnight. It was the same visitor that used to come in and see him. He was in prison for six months. After six months, the CPS decided that he, he hadn't actually murdered the guy. But his time in prison was made bearable 
by somebody who's just visiting him and just listening. In fact, it might have been, without that person listening to him, he might not have been here today, and he hadn't done what they were accusing him of. And that's as vital as it can be. If you are prepared to listen, that will make such a difference to the men that are in prison. Um, a lot of what I was going to say, as you said, <laughs> um, it's, prison has plenty of people who will guide a man through um, the practicalities of things in, inside. So you've got orderlies, people like Marcus, people like myself, who will help people get through the first few days, will be there to say what you should do, and more often than not what you shouldn't do, and when to do it. Officers are there really to help the place run smoothly. But, you know, yes, they keep order, but in fact, they would rather, in a lot of cases, pass the problem on to somebody else. They're there to keep order, lock you up at the right time, get you out, and make sure there's as little trouble as possible. And recently, the Farmer Report just um, published that 39% of offenders who receive regular familial visits don't go on to reoffend. Well, that begs the question, what happens to those people who don't have regular familial visits? Is there an opening there for somebody to go in and talk to them and give them that connection to the outside world and make it so that they've got something to look forward to? Um, the progression route, if you're going on rottles or you're going on home leaves, if you've got no family and friends and nobody on the outside who you can contact, you're severely compromised there, you cannot get rottles or when you can, but it's very much more difficult to get rottles which is released on temporary license to go out for the day to get the use to getting back outside. It becomes more and more difficult. Um, the SVP I think is in a unique position. You've got nationwide coverage and if what Ian tells me is true you've got lots of people who are willing to volunteer to help. Um, in prison these volunteers, the SVP in Berwyn was, was recognised because you're there because you want to be there. You're not being paid. You're not like some of the other charities that employ people to go in and say, we'll help you with housing, whatever. But at five o'clock, they go home and they finish their work for the day. The SVP are there because they want to be there, because they want to make a difference. And as prisoners, we know that you're going to do that and if it takes till 8 o'clock at night, you're going to do it. And we get more results from volunteers most of the time than we do the other people who are getting paid for the job to do it. Um, at Berwyn, we, we had a volunteer who has subsequently become part of the chaplaincy team. She reached out to the local conferences in the Wrexham area um, for assistance in providing both materials and equipment for, and for help with visiting men at the weekly mass. Um, I was there for, at Berwyn from more or less when it opened. And from a slow start, we got men, the numbers of men attending the services up to 40, it was 50 last week apparently, um, and there's 10 volunteers on average go every week. They don't go every week, but there are volunteers there every week from one of the various conferences. And the funny thing about the Catholic services is it probably the most uh, with the exception of the Muslim service, it's the most uh, attended service, it's a widely attended service. And the, thing about, the other thing about the Catholic service at Berwyn in particular is there are so many faiths that are represented there. I've been to Mass, I've been with Muslims, I've been with Ch uh, Church of England, Jehovah's Witnesses, Rastafarians, they all go. And it's not just the tea and biscuits that they provide, but they have them. Does it help? It does help. <laughs> and apparently the SVP are the only uh, association that provides the and biscuits, so that's possibly why they were there. But it, it's just that 15 to 20 minutes afterwards where you can actually talk to somebody outside. Some of the, some of the guys will not have talked to anybody other than the visitors. And we've got one lady called Anne who comes, I think she comes every fortnight, and she's 80. She walks with two sticks. And she walks in and she sits there and she's given a seat, she's brought a cup of tea, brought a sort of cake, and she's actually made a fuss of. And one of the guys, one of the 
biggest troublemakers, if you like, in the prison. Everybody knows he's behind all the trouble in prison, but he goes there on a Saturday morning and he will look after her. And if anybody says, even swears in her presence, he's up in arms about it. But that's because it's a connection to the outside world. It's not something that he's going to get anywhere else. Um, one of the other guys that was involved in the uh, services, he left in Christmas last year. So he'd been going to the services, he'd been helping with the teas and coffees. And he wasn't going back, there was nothing going to get him back to prison. By Easter, he was back in, he was back in Burma. And he lamented the fact that there was nothing there outside of the gear. All these agencies were promising, we'll do this for you, we'll help you with housing, we'll help you get a job, we'll help you with universal credit. They weren't there once they got out of the gear. They promised everything up to the gear. When you're on the other side of the gear, you're almost forgotten. And that's, you know, something that I think the SVP can help with. Um, I know Ian and the people at Hindley, that they're sort of developing things in the way that they, they've gone. It, it should be something that all the conferences can do, you know, with their local prisons. You know, what, what do men need? Universal credit is a big thing. When you apply for universal credit, you have, obviously you need uh, an email address. When are you going to get an email address? If you've got no family, no friends, how are you going to get that? To contact your work coach or your benefit supervisor, you're not going to get one. But if you can have a mobile phone issued by somebody at the prison, you then go for mobile phone. It doesn't have to be an expensive one, but something that you can use to make those appointments, to then speed up the process and try and get on the ladder so much quicker so that you've got that money to sustain yourself. Because 43, 47 pounds, it doesn't go very far. It doesn't go very far at all. Um, most of the people who actually leave prison will make their first visit the off license, where they'll buy their cigarettes and their beer. Um, and they've only got 20 quid left after they've got 10 pounds of the cigarettes and a few pounds of beer. And that is the, the local prisons, uh, sorry, the local shops know that the prisoners are coming. They know 10, 11 o'clock when it's thrown out time, that they know that they're going to get that. And that's, you know, something that we ought to think about. Um, I think you've discussed about, uh, housing. Help with housing is important. A lot of these people, and I've known people, there's a guy who was released to Wrexham. Uh, and Wrexham Borough Council, it was in the summer last year, Wrexham Borough Council, in their wisdom, thought it was a good idea to give them a tent for the first few nights because they didn't have anywhere for them to go. And uh, Daily Express had a, an article a couple of years ago where Leeds City Council, that's what they were doing. That was their answer to homelessness from prison. Because a lot of these hostels won't accept ex prisoners, a lot of private landlords won't accept prisoners. But as a group, if we are, if we talk to the people and then tell them that we're, you know, we're, we're not selecting the people, but we're actually helping people who need help. Some private landlords will accept uh, prisoners and it wouldn't be a great leap to, to get them to, to join in with us. Um, Jay's spoken about seasonal clothing. I, I found that amazing when people were walking out of prison and they were walking out of Durham prison in the cold in shorts and t-shirts. And that's, you know, it's unreal. Um, an escort, at Berwyn, we have an escort provided by PACT, which is another organisation, which is, it seems to have fallen by the wayside, but they used to offer a service where if you were going to a local North Wales prison, they would pick you up from reception and actually take you to your first probation appointment. You're supposed to go to your first probation appointment on that day, and if you don't, then you know they don't look at it very well, and you might there is a chance that you can get recalled. So those appointments are really important for men to get to, and if you, anybody can help with getting them there, that's a bonus. Um, what men need are somebody to care for. They don't want. Uh, a lot of material things a lot of the time, you know, there are things that are required, but somebody who cares, somebody who's willing to listen is a 
vital when you're in there and you've got nobody else. I mean, I was a listener, Marcus was a listener. You are there to help prevent people from harming themselves from um, suicide. With a little bit of listening, as an ongoing on an ongoing basis, you can manage to bring people around and stop them making, you know, a decision that is going to affect the rest of their life. Um, everybody in the prisons has been told that there's a new scheme. It's the um, key worker scheme, where you're supposed to get an officer for 20 minutes every fortnight, three weeks, comes to talk to you, actually asks about how you are, and, and sees what you need, what support the prison can give you. I was there for two and a half years. In that two and a half years, I saw my key worker three times, and I spent less than an hour with him in total. So the key worker system it is not working. There's nobody there to provide that ongoing support and to start preparing people. I mean, I was lucky, I, I sorted myself out, but there are people there who can't sort themselves out who need that direction, need that assistance to plan for getting out. You know, wages are, you do get paid in, in prison, but they're paying people wages of seven pounds, eight pounds. A packet of vapes, because they're on and smoking now, a packet of vapes is four pounds 99, isn't it? Yeah, four pounds 99 for three vapes. Three vapes won't last any of the men inside a week to smoke. So, there's no money, you're not able to save for getting out. There's nothing. One, where I'm talking is uh, Cat C environment. If you're working in a Cat D environment, open conditions, you can then get the benefit of working outside and, and earning something and trying to save something together. But if you're going from a Cat C closed environment outside, you're not going to be able to save anything to get out with. So, you are going to be leaving this for three pounds. Um, all I would ask is that everyone considers whether they can give some time, you know, one, two hours a month, because the time does meet, it does make so much difference to the people that they visit. It does actually make a real difference. And I've seen it change people's lives. Thanks, Charlie. Churches are a prime, a prime example because there will be there will be vulnerable people there. There will be children there. There will be um, females there. Um, so probation in itself will have quite strict, um, strict, strict rules. And in some ways, it's it's very good because it helps protect protect people. Um, but that's that's where we need to build stronger relationships between the local churches and the the prisons and probation. Um, I'm doing a pilot scheme at the moment at uh, Hindley around that, so that we can 
we can understand so that somebody within the church um, can be responsible for that person and that can, that can, that can be with them. And it's about then showing that that risk is, that risk is lower. Because whilst, whilst people are inside, the risk is gone. It's as soon as they come back into the community. Yeah, so that Because yeah. yeah. there is a safeguard issue from yes. the parish's point of view. Yes, they have to. Because we as a parish yep. have to make that safeguarding Correct. arrangement yeah. if we know that an ex-offender is coming yeah. to our parish. Right. Yeah, it's, and it's no different. I sort of explained it with, with yeah. Marcus. You know, I've made myself my own safeguarding um, plans as, as such, and I and I be Marcus perfectly safe to sit in the same car as the fact he then didn't go and show it and do that. He was pushing pushing me little grand to put in the buggy over. Because I know Marcus and I have that relationship with him. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's about people in the community and then starting to get to know people and allowing them to come back into the community. But there are sadly some people that, that cannot function back in There's another lady here actually who was talking about that in their parish in Leeds. I think she was Leeds at another conference. I was at another SVP member. And they arranged as a couple to take this person yeah. and to sit with them. But he was not allowed to go if he didn't go with them because then he was just free. You know, it, it's, it's, the church has a responsibility on both sides there. Yeah, yeah. and, it's, and it's, it's a hard one for a church mm -hmm. to get to, to balance right. It really is a hard one because we believe in rehabilitation um, and forgiveness. But also, yeah, we have a due cost Well, it's the law. It's not, yeah. not even just our choice. That's it's right. The law. We have to be too. Uh, John has just gone to reserve some tables there in case you want to continue the discussion because we're running very late. But very quick. Um, we've got a food bank in Manchester, and uh, probably every other week somebody will come and just tell us that they're just going to visit from the house. So we give them a, we give them a food bank and a smile. A food bank and a smile. Sometimes we don't see them again. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how we could better help or be more engaging to 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 That could be done through the, the probation service. I had to, I had to get a, a food parcel last week, but it had to be probation. It had to be it to the to the people who were supplying them. No, we 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 don't we don't require it. So if people people just turn up.